So honestly, probably the biggest highlight of our fun little trip down to Dallas is meeting here with Bill with Phoenix Reptiles, and he is world famous, at least I think he's world famous, for his work with green trees and ball pythons and some other really cool crazy stuff. So do you want to, you know, kind of give a little spiel about how you got started and, you know, what you do here? Sure. Jay-Z, uh, first of all, it's great to meet you. Thanks for coming all the way from Colorado to check out the collection before the NARBC show. It's cool. Really uh, nice to meet you. Oh, yeah. And uh, like you said, um, you know, uh, I focus primarily on ball pythons and green tree pythons. Mm -hmm. I've got some other smaller uh, uh, animals that I work with, rough scale pythons uh, that we're going to take a look at today. Uh, and then some Borneo short tail pythons awesome. that I enjoy working with. Uh, so, yeah, I've been doing it for about 20 years. I like probably a lot of people started with ball pythons uh, and my son when he was young. And we kind of grew this business together. Mm -hmm. And that was approximately 20 years ago. And uh, like a lot of people, just had a lot of organic growth and was lucky to get introduced, get introduced to green tree pythons about a decade ago. And uh, just super lucky to have popped out some crazy stuff. And so it's now kind of the highlight and focus of my collection. Awesome. So, you know, your guys are called Phoenix Reptiles and a lot of people think that you guys are in Arizona. Do you know, uh, why, why did you uh, pick the name Phoenix Reptiles? Uh, phoenix reptiles, the phoenix um, is the mythical bird, mm -hmm. the phoenix that comes back from uh, the ashes. And I chose that name because shortly after I uh, turned this into a small business, my father passed away and his company was named Phoenix Enterprise. So in uh, uh, memory of him, I took under, under the name Phoenix instead of Enterprise. I, called it Phoenix Reptiles. Awesome, cool. All right, Jay-Z, let's look at some baby green tree pythons. All right, sounds good. Let's and uh, these are all from uh, the sickness bred to a blue cyclops locality awesome. type animal, and we'll take a look at those also today. Um, baby green tree pythons come out, you probably know, either red or yellow as babies, mm -hmm. and then they undergo an autumn genetic color change, anywhere from a year to up to, in some locality types, five years, it takes oh, wow. them to get their complete adult coloration. So all the babies that you're going to see today are red. It was a completely red clutch. Okay. Which um, in what the projects I'm trying to work on is good because I breed mostly for high black and high blue mm -hmm. and most of those adult animals are going to come from red babies. So that is what is being found to be a little bit more of like a consistent thing because I know it's a bit of a crapshoot essentially when it comes to, to green trees. So, but It's always, yeah, it's always a crapshoot uh, when you're trying to breed designer line animals for specific color traits. Mm -hmm. um, but you get your best chances when you're breeding uh, animals that were red neonates themselves. Okay. And then obviously to have a lineage or a history of producing the traits that you're looking for, like high blue or high black. Cool. So this clutch, my, my goal was, my anticipation was, I'm looking for high black babies. All right. And we'll, we'll look at some. Uh, some of these are already starting to change. They're seven months old, which is pretty early. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll look at one in particular that is the black that's really starting to come in. It's pretty cool. Cool. Okay. So let's just start taking a look here. So this is a pretty typical looking animal from the clutch. All right. And again, these are all seven months, red neonates, and that uh, kind of diamond dorsal pattern you'll see a lot of in, in these clutches. And they're anywhere from yellow like this one mm -hmm. to bright white to a green color in between. Well, I notice he's a lot darker than what I've seen a lot of red neonates. Is that because it comes from that really dark, melanistic line of animal, or...? I think so, and I hope so. Okay. Uh, we'll see some that are a little bit lighter than, than this one. Okay. And the one that I'm going to show you that's already started to change was actually one of the lightest in the clutch. Hmm. And now it's turned very, very dark. Uh, so that's unusual, uh, a little unpredictable, but that's a lot of the fun with uh, green tree pythons. Awesome, yeah. And you can see this, they're super easy to take care of. I take care of them exactly the same way I take care of my baby ball pythons. The okay. difference is, is I put a stick in here that they yep. can perch on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I say, yeah, you have that little, just the, you know, the hatchling rack. And it's just a ball python hatchling rack. Uh, pretty much the same temps. I do increase the humidity of these babies' tubs a little bit more than I do ball pythons because okay. they require a little bit higher humidity. Mm -hmm. um, but really pretty easy to take care of. Cool. If you get a captive bred animal and, and uh, 
you know, certainly for somebody that's a beginner, I would advise to stay away from imports. Yep, yep, that's definitely the case. Captive bred for definitely probably for the most part, it's always the way to go for sure. And you know, but unfortunately, there's still a lot of imports of green trees. There are. And once again, unfortunately, that price tag is a lot different it's, too. It is. Well, they're really um, a lot of times two totally different animals. Mm -hmm. You're just not going to run into the problems with a captive bred animal that you are with an import. Yep. And I mean, so because I mean, you're absolutely right, it's an entirely different thing. It's you know they don't have the parasite load. It's just really every single thing about that. Certainly, I've seen that with retics as well as um, you know the short tails and the bloods and things like that too. Would you recommend that if someone was very first getting into snakes and that they see one of your animals and they think, oh my lord, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, was that a snake that you would even recommend giving to a beginner? Probably not, to okay. be honest. Um, I would direct them to, again, a, a U.S. captive bred animal, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have to be a crazy designer, thousands of dollars animal. You know, you can get a good U.S. captive bred animal starting around the $500 mark. Oh, wow. And if you look at that compared to what you're going to pay for a farm bred animal mm -hmm. or a imported baby, by the time you get finished with the vet visits, yep. you're going to be better off with the captive bred, U.S. captive bred uh, animal because you're going to, especially as a beginner, get a lot of support from the breeder. Mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely worth a little extra money. Awesome. So let's take a look at a few more. Okay. Again, this is a pretty common theme. Again, this one is starting to turn dark. I mean, I don't know how well that's going to show on camera, but you can see the dorsal area along here is really starting to get dark uh, compared to the lateral sides that are a, a lighter colored red. That's crazy. And then I'll show you the one that's changed the most so far. It's this one. Holy moly. So you, Look at that. That is nuts. You can see definitely the black washings coming in through the vast majority of the body. Wow. Did the sickness look like this? This is how the sickness looked oh. at, 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 at this age. So why don't you hold this and then I'll get another one out and we'll just kind of compare. Okay. That way they can kind of see the difference on the coloration side by side. That is nuts. You probably already have people bidding for this little one, huh? Yeah, this this was a so here's kind of the side by side like a of the, of the rest of the clutch and hopefully the rest of the clutch will follow suit with with the darker one and get those those that black melanism that we're looking for. It's awesome. So Jay Z, let's take a look at some adult green tree pythons. Okay, cool. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is is called the sickness. He's an animal I produced five years ago uh, of the baby green trees that that we've seen. He's the sire. Mm -hmm. We'll take a look at the dam in a minute too, but um, he's a very melanistic animal uh, considering the most green trees are basically green. Right. Uh, he popped out of a clutch that I produced five years ago. He was unique looking as an individual Okay. and he didn't disappoint as he underwent his ontogenetic color change. Awesome. So let's take a look at him. Five years old now and produced for the first time last year. Awesome. <laughs> That's so crazy. It's just amazing. They're just like just completely different from, you know, you just see the ball pythons all the time. It's like kind of, you know what you're going to get. Yeah. But just, you know, that's, that's just awesome. It's like a whole other ball game for green trees. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, when you breed ball pythons, you know what you can get in the clutch. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get exactly what the odds predict, but with green tree pythons, um, you have no idea what you're going to get. Right. Unless, right. unless you're really breeding strictly locality types, then you're pretty certain what your babies mm -hmm. are going to look like. But when you start to get into the, the, the designer stuff, uh, then you really don't know what you're going to get. All right. That's the best part of it. Absolutely. <laughs> So this is the dam to the uh, clutch that we looked at, the baby uh, red green tree pythons. Uh, the sickness was the sire. She was the female. She laid 17 eggs. I got 15 babies established uh, and they were all uh, red neonates. Awesome. Now, so for you know a whole lot of people, most of the time they're first getting started, they don't know too, too much about these things. 
you mentioned earlier that she's a cyclops. That is a little an island locality. Uh, cyclops is actually a mountain range okay. in Indonesia uh, that they re refer to, but there are a lot of island locality types like Aru and Biak. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, yeah, she's a she's a locality type animal uh, thought to come from the Cyclops Mountain uh, area of Indonesia. Okay, cool. These two animals are animals that came from the, the repeat pairing that produced the sickness. Okay. So the sickness was produced from a Wamina locality type. Okay. She's a very green looking animal on the bottom there. Oh, wow. Cool. So that's the mother to the sickness. And the father to the sickness is a mildly melanistic male. Okay. So uh, we'll take a look at him real quick. So this animal's name is Jaeger, and he is the sire to the sickness. And as you can see, he's in shed right now, but you can still see enough of the melanism, what old school people would call mite phase, mm -hmm. uh, green tree python. Uh, we now call it melanism, different degrees of melanism. And he's got a, a mild degree of melanism throughout his pattern. And you can notice those dorsal uh, yellow kind of diamond markings are pretty consistent in the animals that come from his lineage. Now, he's, he's a designer animal, correct? He'd be considered a designer animal. Okay. Yes, he has uh, a lot of melanism in his background. Um, but certainly not as much... Uh, Melanism as the sickness has. Yeah. So I see that with all the ones that you're pulling out, you're always, you know, you have these detachable perches for ease of moving and stuff. Do you recommend that people who get green tree pythons, you know, have something like this and for the the lack of stress and everything else with moving them on a perch or by free handling? Removable perches are absolute necessity okay. to get these things out. They're just much more comfortable when they get out of their cage. They're not... Uh, threatened um, and it's just you can let them come off this perch more leisurely at their pace once you get it out of the cage. Awesome. So, so we'll put him back. We'll look at Jay-Z are actually repeat the repeat pairing that produced the sickness. So Jaeger bred to the Wamina locality type. Okay. And uh, these are also melanistic animals but again not as much melanism or blackness as the sickness, but they still look creamy. So this is, this animal is called the plague. That's crazy. So once again, this is the repeat parents of the sickness. So right. Two years later. Right. So it's not a clutch mate, but it's technically a sibling. Correct. And you can still see that all that melanistic flecking or, or, or color is just still coming through on that. Right. And you can see all these animals that we've gotten out are very docile. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's going to be one of the big difference between a captive bred animal and an imported animal. Import animals tend to be much more defensive mm -hmm. inside the cage and out. And all of the green trees that I have, every single one of them, I can get out and handle just like this. Awesome. Okay, let's take a look at uh, another one of the uh, repeat pairing babies from that produce the sickness. This is called epidemic. All right. Okay. So, and again, kind of that theme of melanism throughout the dorsal areas mm -hmm. primarily. This animal's got a lot of nice blue in it as well. But you can definitely see that sickness kind of genetics coming through there okay and even at this age do you think more is still going to keep coming through as he gets older too no that's not typical okay they typically they if they're going to lose melanism they lose it as they get older. okay um but this one's been pretty stable for the last year or so all right i think it's probably going to stay about about like this as a full-grown adult cool and again super sweet temperament as docile as can be They're just such awesome little snakes. They are, they are fun. I'll let you kind of just take the stick, and then the, the best way to get them off is just come up underneath them. Okay. And just gently kind of do, do their thing. Hey there. You can tell 
you know, you can see most of these are, are by nature very docile. Mm -hmm. They're her first response was to tuck her head and right. not to come out and defend her perch. So that's pretty, really typical behavior again of a captive bred green right. tree that's been in a collection, you know, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like you, she knows we're not a threat. Yep. Definitely notice that usually it's, you know, the first reaction, even, even with some of the more established imports, it's always just kind of, oh, leave me alone. Right. And then it's, you know, that reactionary defensive start to strike. Yeah, they're all different. They all have different temperaments, personalities. Right. Let's see if we can start kind of easing her off a little bit. Okay. So this girl is... This girl is, uh, her name's Bizkit. Okay. And she's uh, obviously what we consider a high yellow green mm -hmm. tree python. A friend of mine in Austin uh, produced this animal. His name's Matt Morris. Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. Okay. Yeah, he's a great guy and uh, produces a lot of high yellow animals. And she had her first clutch last year as well. Oh, wow. Cool. So do you think the, the yellow just comes from, you know, specific lineages or do you think it originates in several of the localities? You can see high yellow in locality or, or even just first generation locality crosses, which we'll take a look at an example of that. Okay. But most of the high yellow animals uh, consistently come from, again, designer animals that have been bred mm -hmm. for generations to produce uh, high yellow. Cool. And high yellow animals can come from both yellow or red neonates. <laughs> that must be someone who's trying to get a blue or melanistic animal, they buy the red neonate and then they end up with the yellow animals that... It can happen. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Here's a great example of, I don't know if you can see this, her tail. You see how her tail is a completely different color than the rest of her? Yeah. She uses that tail to attract prey items in the wild. I believe that term is called caudal luring, correct? That's it. All right, cool. Have you ever noticed that in any of these guys? Have you ever seen they that? They do it all the time. Awesome. Yeah, it's fun to watch. And they will wiggle that tail just like you would think that a worm might wiggle, <laughs> trying to anticipate some prey to come their way. They're ambush predators from low-lying uh, tree branches. Right, yeah. Like when they're hungry, you just kind of know somewhere they kind of slowly stretch down. and Absolutely. Okay. They get in a very distinct position when they're hunting. And that usually happens at night. Cool. Well, as long as we're on the subject, um, when it comes to feeding, you know, what? How often do you feed? You know, these guys aren't 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 aren't, pi aren't the ball python and the Burmese pythons that we're used to. Right. Uh, you know, babies I tend to feed once a week until okay. they're you know roughly a year uh, of age, and then they'll spread out to that once every ten days. And adults typically get fed once every two weeks. Okay. The, uh, one of the big mistakes that new keepers will keep when keeping green trees are they'll keep them too warm and they'll feed them too much. Yep. So these are meant to be very uh, thin. They're uh, strictly arboreal. Mm -hmm. uh, so they stay in the trees all the time and they are meant to be kept uh, very lean. Well, since you, uh, since you kind of brought it up, so what, so what temps do you normally see on the, on, do you keep your guys on? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, probably my ambient uh, temp is 75, 76 degrees, and then the hottest that these things will get will be about 85 degrees. So quite a bit lower than what you see on like a ball python. Yeah, and in fact at night they get no supplemental heat. Okay. So the heat goes off at night and then they're just left with that uh, ambient temperature of anywhere from 72 to 75 degrees at night. Cool. Uh, when I'm breeding them, cycling to breed, uh, I'll lower that temperature all the way down to 70 degrees at night. Wow. Again, with no supplemental heat, so. Well, clearly they're all doing just fine, so. Yeah, they're doing great. So let's take a look at a rough scale python. Okay. So rough scale pythons are indigenous to a very small part of Australia. And um, they were thought extinct until I think somewhere in the 1970s, they were rediscovered in a very small part of Australia and uh, have made it excellent uh, comeback in that country and we're lucky enough to have them uh, in the United States as well. Right. These are probably one of the rarest one of the rarest animals that we have here in the States. I, I would think probably so. There was an article that came out it's been several years ago now but the title of the article was the rarest snake in the world. Oh wow. And they were talking about rough scale pythons. So and they're called rough scale pythons because their scalation it, they have keeled scales mm -hmm. like a rattlesnake and 
it's kind of hard to see in pictures or in videos, but when you well, handle this animal, it's, you'll notice a big difference. They're known for that, and then they're, they're uh, pale blue eyes yeah those things are really striking it's crazy it's almost like it's coming out of like it's coming out of blue about to shed but that's just what it looks like all the time exactly that's awesome genetically these are uh clo most closely related to green tree pythons really if you can believe that oh wow uh, but i keep them more like i keep carpet pythons they tend to like to bask as opposed to perch mm -hmm. so i have the cork bark in there they like a basking spot and um I think that they would perch if I gave them an arboreal setup, but I've just chosen to keep them in more of a terrestrial okay. type environment. I was going to say the coloration is pretty similar to you know the uh, Brettles or yeah. the Centralia carpets. No, it Are definitely they... looks more carpet-like, obviously, than mm -hmm. green tree-like. Okay, we can get him up. Wake him up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go ahead and feel him, feel his scalation. Oh, wow. That just feels so crazy. It's almost like it's similar to an Angolan, but it's not quite the same. That's crazy. They're really neat animals, very docile. It's a good thing they're docile because they have massive teeth. Kind of like the green trees? Bigger than green trees. Oh, wow. And they're thought to have those big teeth because the area of Australia that they come from, the local rodent there tends to have a very tough, uh, thick, coat of fur. Oh, wow. So they've developed those very long teeth to, to to deal with those rodents. Yeah. Wow. You can totally see that really close up. Yeah. Just like the rattlesnake. That's so cool. That's amazing. This is a Candino black pastel female, an adult female. So a Candino uh, is a cross between a pure candy and an albino. Both those traits are recessive, but uh, they're also allelic, which is the only combination of recessive genes that are allelic, which means if you breed an albino to a candy, you don't get double hets. You get a visual blending of the animal. All the clucks will be visual animals. and It'll be kind of a blending of the candy and the albino traits. Kind of like the crystal or any of the animals in the blue-eyed uh the cystic complex, right? Exactly. Perfect. But, the, but okay. those are incomplete dominant traits. Yes. And these are recessive traits. So almost like in boas, the, the paradigm boa. Like between the boa, woman, caramel, and the sharp albino. Right. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we did a little video about that, about boa genetics, and that came up there too. And so, yeah, this is the, the ball the python. ball python version. Which is probably more popular, but I like candinos. They're really cool. So this is a pure candy. This is a candy leopard cool. female. So it is a visual recessive candy and the incomplete dominant leopard. Leopard trait, exactly. Cool. Yeah, we always get a lot of questions about exactly what everything is because you know we, we're just used to just you know rattling stuff off. And so for sure, for sure. Slow it down and explain things a little bit. So, so this is a neat combination. This is a banana. Black pastel pinstripe. That's awesome. Female. Yeah, very happy with the way she came out. Again, a lot of orange mm -hmm. on her dorsal markings with the purple. I feel like pinstripe kind of is one of those forgotten things that I feel like it could be reintroduced to a lot of really cool stuff. I love the way this one came out. That's awesome. Ball pythons still amaze me sometimes. I've been working with them for 20 years and they still amaze me every year. I produce multiple animals. Animals I just, I can't believe that they are real. Is a lesser orange dream sugar without the pinstripe. That's awesome. It's so cool. You can just see like every little, you know, contributing gene that it does to that. Absolutely. She's very, very clean. Very high contrast. That's a holdback. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I do have a small collection of Borneo short tail pythons. Cool. And those are in the blood python family. Um, so I've got uh, six or eight adult and sub-adult animals. These are the biggest steak that I keep. Okay. Um, and uh, they're really, they're fun. The genetics are a lot 
more like green tree pythons than they are ball pythons. Mm -hmm. So they don't have strict recessive and dominant traits. They have uh, more blending uh, traits and attributes uh, when, when you breed them. So let's take a look at the at the biggest one that I have. Oh, that's a big one. So this is a full size adult female Borneo short tail python. And she is considered to be a super stripe possible ocelot. Okay. And you can see the super stripe. Yep. Uh, why she would be called that because of the pretty consistent dorsal stripe along her. That's awesome. She's the biggest snake in my collection. That's a big girl though. It's a big girl. Kind of the uh, exact opposite is the green trees. Yep. <laughs> that long slender. But yep, this guy's they're uh, a little bit beefier. Yeah, more like a tank. So this mutation is called a granite. Cool. That's awesome. She's pretty. They're such cool little animals. They have the usual kind of the reputation of having them, you know, only go to the bathroom like once every couple months. And... Yeah, then that reputation is true. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and when they go, they go. Uh huh. classified as a super stripe I just love the heads on them yeah they've got neat heads they're really cool awesome Um, you know, so that was really great. Thanks so much for showing us around and opening up your awesome collection to us. Um, you know, if anybody wants to get a hold of you or has questions or interested in buying any animals from you, where can they get a hold of you? Yeah, it was a pleasure uh, meeting you and spending some time with you today, Jay-Z. Um, I've got a Facebook under my name, Bill Stiegel. Uh, I also have a Facebook reptile page, which is Phoenix Reptiles. I'm on Instagram as well. Ooh. Coming up on 10,000 followers there. Nice. So if you'll check out phoenix.reptiles on Instagram and follow me there, I post a lot of pictures there and on my Facebook pages as well. Some really cool stuff on there too. Well, thanks again, Bill. You bet. Really appreciate pleasure, it. Pleasure meeting you. Yep, and I will see you later at the show. All right, enjoy yourself. Thanks.